Hello, welcome to this third session of my class, Jesus as Political Radical. So what I'm going to talk today about is the, the notion of Jesus's prophetic challenge. So uh, Richard Horsley has a notion that, that Jesus's mission had really uh, two, two sort of arms or branches, uh, one of those being uh, prophetic challenge to the Roman Empire and to uh, the parts of the Jewish community that were colluding with Rome. And then the other uh, piece of it is uh, communal renewal and that the idea of communal renewal and healing uh, is something I will ad address in the next video. I'm going to, so, but I'm going to, I'm going to focus on um, prophetic challenge today. Before I do that, I thought I'd give a few more comments about the notion of Jesus as as political radical, because I think that when you present a picture, a portrait of who Jesus is, people often ask the question, well, how do you know? <laughs> you know, how do you know? And Richard Horsley has a way of answering that, which is, you know, something along the lines of what I've been talking about that, you know, when you don't dehistoricize Jesus. And when you instead situate him in the social and political context, it becomes very difficult not to see how some of his teachings would have been rendered, you know, received as problematic, uh, to say the least, among his hearers uh, who were, you know, parts of parts of Rome and, and parts of um, the communities that were collaborating with Rome. So that is, you know, that is certainly true. And I think there's a lot of plausibility in that. But the other thing that I want to point out, point up or point out and just lift up here is that identifying Jesus as any particular thing is a complicated endeavor. And I'm not sure that it's that it's really a possible thing to do. So you might think, well, that just you know, totally torpedoed the point of this entire class, but hear me out um, on this. So there is a movement in um, some parts of historical Jesus research to achieve some degree of, of what they consider to be objectivity. I mean, you get something like the Jesus seminar, which has a group of scholars and, um, you know, intellectuals who come together to listen to different passages of the Bible, and then they vote on which parts they think are more authentic to Jesus and which ones they think are less authentic to Jesus. And, and there's, there is a notion in, in, some, in some circles that, you know, the community of scholars can produce a portrait of what they think is more authentic and that by reading that and reconstructing from that, from those kernels that we think are, you know, genuine and authentic, we can get a picture of who Jesus was. What I would suggest is that I think those methods are extremely valuable. I think they're also really compelling, interesting. And at the same time, even if, you have all the sayings that you believe are genuine in the acts and moments of Jesus's life that you think are accurate and, and genuine, you're still going to be using a modern frame of reference to reconstruct those elements into some sort of portrait of who Jesus is. And one of the things that my professor, Elizabeth Schussler Fiorenza, points out is that um, you, you would think that if this was a straightforward objective search that once um, the historical Jesus research has winnowed down, you know, to the, the core sayings that it thinks are authentic and which ones that thinks are not, what you will get is a fairly consistent picture. I mean, maybe there will be some disagreements around the edges, but you'll have a pretty consistent thought about who Jesus was. That's 
not the case. <laughs> in fact, people, first of all, there's still debate and controversy about which parts are authentic and which are not. That has never gone away. And if you want to delve into that, um, there's this book. Hold on a second. This book, uh, The Historical Jesus, um, a comprehensive guide by Thiessen and Mers, um, it really delves into, into that reality and basically shows how there's intense controversy about, you know, each of the um, sayings, each of the parables, each of the, of the instances in Jesus's life. In fact, there's, there's a limited, a very limited number that scholars tend to agree on. You know, oftentimes it's boiled down to something like Jesus was born, he was baptized, he had some sort of conflict at the temple and he was crucified. And then you might have, uh, you know, other things that scholars, um, some scholars will agree on and others won't. But in any case, that's a, it's a limited amount that's even agreed upon as being authentic. But putting that aside, let's pretend, like, let's just pretend that we did have a, a, a good chunk that people agreed upon. Well, the historical Jesus scholarship that we have today is um, pretty widely diverse in terms of the portrait that it wants to produce of, of who he is. So you get um, Jesus as Mediterranean peasant, you get Jesus as cynic, you get Jesus as stoic, you get Jesus as um, kind of like a magician in the sense of, um, you know, there were lots of magical practitioners in the ancient world. Maybe Jesus was just another one of those. Um, Jesus as a Jew, you know, as a rabbi, um, on and on. I mean, you really get, you get lots of different theories. Um, oh, one I was gonna mention is you may have heard of Reza Aslan's book, Zealot, which is one that broke into sort of the mainstream based on historical Jesus research and really presenting a picture of Jesus as, as being politically radical in many of the same ways that we're talking uh, about in, in this class. But you know that's another option, identifying him with the zealots. So you, you have um, multiple different visions of, of who Jesus might be. Um, within the historical Jesus movement. So why, why might that be? I mean, like if, you know, if we're really doing historical research there, shouldn't we just all, you know, be coming to a conclusion about, you know, this is, this is the accurate portrayal of, of who this person was. Well, you know, I think that his, doing history, doing historical research, especially into oral cultures, especially when you have limited documentation, it's not the same. Objectivity in, in that field is not going to look the same as objectivity in certain fields of science, for example. You don't have a Petri dish that's sitting in front of you with all the relevant data inside of it, and you're just kind of observing what's happening there. Instead, you're engaging in a pretty sophisticated interaction with the data that's coming to you, bringing your own sense from your own culture, from say 21st century American culture about what, is, what the limitations and possibilities would even be uh, for someone in Jesus's position, limitations and possibilities that may, um, have been outside the horizon of of who uh, of of Jesus's time, and and therefore may or may not make sense in terms of um, what Jesus might have been doing. And so, I think there has to be some level of acceptance that even the most objective presentation of of who Jesus might be is is going to be. Um, pretty pretty deeply inflected uh, by our own coloring of what this historical research can look like and, and should look like and what its content should be. There's a lot of sophisticated thinkers who write about this. I mean, I think that, you know, they want to avoid 
the notion that anything anything goes because I think it doesn't. I mean, I think that you know you can have a portrait that is more possible and a portrait that, that is less possible. So for example, if I you know want to talk about things that are wildly historically anachronistic to who Jesus might be, um, such as, you know, he was a free market capitalist. Okay, uh, the free market didn't exist. Capitalism didn't exist. Uh, you know, uh, that is a, a an alien anachronism that you are forcing onto a context that's, it wouldn't have, it wouldn't have even register what you were talking about. You know, if you much less try to present that as the portrait of who Jesus was. So, but then you can also have frames that lots of different frames that might actually be more possible. And, you know, cynic philosophers were present in the ancient world. Um, there were different people who called themselves the Messiah there were different political radicals and revolutionaries there were different sorts of religious slash magico religious uh, leaders at the time and so if you're presenting a category that does make sense in jesus's culture and you're doing the best you can to marshal the research that that is available then i think I think it might suffice, at least this is my own view, to say, well, this is this is a likelihood. This is a possibility. This is something that's worth entertaining. That's really different than saying anything goes, right? John Dominic Crossan, historical Jesus scholar, really important. He calls this the interactive approach. It's the notion that we're always interacting with the information that is coming you know, from from the past and and we're being reflective on our own lens and noticing and trying and trying as fully as possible to notice what anachronisms we are bringing so that, that we can bracket those and try to set them aside at the same time acknowledging that you know we're never gonna we're never gonna have that full picture. The resources are too limited and history doesn't really work that way so i hope that that gives a little bit more of a sense um you know so if you were to leave this class and say well jesus was a political radical and somebody says oh no 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 Je jesus wasn't a political radical how could you ever prove that well i mean my question would be how do you prove anything from history what you do is you try to show that in that context at that time using the tools that we have available it's pretty you know good possibility that this may have happened but that's about all you can say there's never there's never like you know certainty um about that okay so I'm going to pause that there and now move on to this this question of Jesus's prophetic challenge to the Roman Empire. So, um, you know, going back to Horsley and what you know he's he's talking about and focusing on in this chapter. Um, one of the things that he talks about is that in and this goes to this conversation about you know historical likelihood historical possibility what historical templates were available in order to that people in that century would have had in order to understand the activity of a religious leader who was coming in well there's a really particular one in judaism and it's not universal it's not one that was just available in every community in the ancient world and just readily they just had to pluck it up and use it to in interpret what they were seeing it was unique to israel 
And it was the institution or role of, of the prophet. And what you have to understand about prophecy in ancient Israel is that the moment that you had the first king and the institution of the monarchy emerge, you immediately had, at least this is what's documented in the sacred, sacred writings of Judaism, you immediately had the institution of the prophet emerge. And the prophet performed a really interesting role. The prophet sometimes sanctioned and more often than not challenged <laughs> the existing order. So you do definitely get instances where the prophet goes and anoints the king and says, you know, you are on a sacred mission from God. This is the prophet saying this to whatever king there is. And, um, you know, rule, rule justly and according to, you know, the commandments that God has given. So you definitely have that. But then you also have prophets who are quite dislocated from the institutional power would not have been welcomed in the in the king's court and who were just issuing jagged and um forceful indictments of the monarchy and these were often geared around the oppression of the marginalized you have Amos in particular as one that I'm thinking of who, you know, talks about how, you know, the, the king has, has trampled on, on the backs of the poor and dispossessed the widows and the children are starving. And all of that is going to bring down God's judgment. And really, you know, this institution of the prophet would garner some significant social mobility be, or social energy behind it you know there would be followers and they would be following this person who was critiquing the powerful in whatever monarchy uh there there was so when jesus <laughs> arrives on the scene and, you know, assuming that he had a period where he was not, you know, it, according to the Gospels, Jesus was ministering for about three years. So maybe a part of his life when he wasn't engaged in, you know, his ministry. And then he arrives in the context of first century Palestine and starts issuing condemnations of imperial power and also of the way that taxation was happening with the temple uh, about the collaboration of uh people who were at the at the temple and the herodians with the romans how are people going to receive that what are they gonna what are, what are they gonna think well one script that would be readily available to them is the script of the prophet right and so jesus even self-identifies as being in this role of prophet so let me read you this selection this is from um this is in math matthew and luke which would mean it's a part of the Q document, right? Because if it's not in Mark and Matthew and Luke are both saying it, then it was in Q, right? So this is a part of the Q document and uh, words of Jesus. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets and stone those who sent you. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings and you refuse Behold, your house is forsaken, for I tell you, you will not see me until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So here we go with, I mean, Jesus is talking about prophets, 
He's offering a prophetic indictment. And this is often what the prophets would say to the people who were in power. You've turned away from the commandments that God has given. And um, oftentimes those would be anchored to some very real economic realities that were happening in Israel at that time. So that, that is a piece of what Horsley is talking about when he says that Jesus was entering into this role of prophetic challenge, that Jesus was entering into this role of the prophet. The other thing that you might pick up from that statement that I just read, oh, Jerusalem, oh, Jerusalem, um, I forget it now, you kill the prophets and stone those who sent you. So obviously, a couple different things there. One is that the writer of Q may have been, may have known and been anticipating what was going to happen to Jesus and, and therefore put, was putting, were putting some of those words into Jesus's mouth. Maybe some or all, we don't know. Um, and, and that would account for these, this language around, you know, you kill the prophets, meaning, you know, Jesus is sort of prophesying his own death in that instance. But there's also a possibility that Jesus did say that, and he just knew that by going in as a prophet, he was engaging in a risky exercise, a risky endeavor. He knew that the prophets were not always lovingly received by the power structure. There are instances of prophets being uh, exiled, instances of prophets being murdered, um, and the monarchy plotting uh, to murder the prophets. Um, I'm thinking of, yeah, I mean, basically just like, let's silence this critic, like rid me of this turbulent priest. I think that's a, a famous a famous saying there. <laughs> but rid me of this turbulent prophet. That's, that's the energy behind that. So, um, so that's, that's very much a part of that passage and, and, and could very well have been, you know, Jesus may have been very self-aware, you know, maybe not, maybe even if Jesus was not cognizant of his own death, assuming, you know, that he was just a human being <laughs> and we're Unitarians. So, you know, that's, that's our assumption. But he, you know, if you go into Russia right now <laughs> and you start critiquing the, you know, official message that the state is giving, or you start critiquing Putin, uh, let me know how well that goes for you, right? Like you, you'll know like whether something's risky. So Jesus may very well have known that, you know, his efforts were risky. So the other thing that Horsley focuses on in this chapter is the episode at the temple, the confrontation at the temple. So th the first thing to note there is that Jesus has lots of confrontations with the Pharisees and the leaders of the of Judaism at that of, at that time. And often these are around uh, issues of purity and the law. He's specifically calling out what he perceives to be a, a sort of outward facing behavior that looks pious while inwardly there's this deep corruption. So why might there inwardly be this deep corruption? Well, when you're claiming to be a holy person, following a religious tradition that says everything belongs to God, and yet you're conspiring with the Romans and even benefiting from Roman imperial rule, you know, the Romans are supporting you and sort of propping you up so that you can have this political power over the other um, 
people who are in, in Israel um, at that time, it would seem that there's some something deeply wrong, right? Something's not connecting. You're claiming to be a holy person, and yet you're conspiring with people who are exploiting the people of Israel, right? So I think that this is important because I think that this gets at the substance of Jesus's critique. And it's a critique that is sometimes used to try to prove that Jesus, that Jesus had a mission apart from Judaism and that, that it was a mission to Gentiles and that um, Jesus was basically criticizing Jewish people. No, he wasn't, he wasn't criticizing Judaism or Jewish people. He was criticizing people who wore, uh, the, the garb of, um, you know, uh, piety, sorry, I was looking for, for that word and couldn't find it, but you know, with that were acting pious and yet inside because of their interactions were deeply contaminated he even says at one point he has this great metaphor of like the cup that like you you polish the cup on the outside he says this to the pharisees you polish the cup on the outside and you leave the inside filthy something along those lines that's exactly what he's talking about okay so he has lots of confrontations like that he gets up to the point of going into the temple. In the episode at the temple, the thing to know about that is that there's a lot of debate, again, you know, going to this monster of a book. Um, there's a lot of debate about what that episode really was and what it might have looked like. Um, scholars do believe that there was something that happened at the temple. One of the interesting theories, and, and one that I think sounds kind of plausible, is that Jesus actually had multiple episodes at the temple. Like maybe he had gone, you know, multiple times and, you know, caused enough of a disruption that finally they were like, you know, we got to deal with this guy. We're sick of him. We got to, you know, get him out. Of, we got to get him out of here. Um, we don't know. We don't, you know, those are, those are questions we don't have answers to. Presumably Jesus would have gone to the temple more than once. So, you know, lots of different ways to reconstruct what that might have looked like. The substance of it, though, is that Jesus went in and had some kind of conflict. What exactly was he squabbling about? Well, it was the system that was taking money from peasants <laughs> in order to sell um, sacrifices so that the person, the peasant person could go and, and give and give a sacrifice, all of which was organized, set up and to the benefit of, you guessed it, Rome, right? So Jesus goes and has a pretty blazing confrontation there. I mean, it's, you know, the report in the gospels is he tips the tables and whips the vendors. And um, it could have even been a, somewhat violent attempt. I mean, you know, for all we know, um, his followers were participating in it as well. So whatever it was, it was enough to get the attention of the Roman officials who afterwards capture him and execute him now what do we know about the way he was executed he was he was hung on a cross we all know that well some people say that there are some scholars who really insist that jesus did not have a social component to his teaching and instead he just outraged the jewish leaders by claiming he was the messiah you know, that was sort of a theory there. The interesting that thing that they then have to contend with, if you're going to make that argument, is that if you were 
if you claim to be the Messiah, lots of people claim to be the Messiah, frankly, and sometimes things happened to them and sometimes it didn't. One guy who did was exiled, for example, like, you you know, we don't like multiple things could have happened to you. But if you if you claim to be the Messiah and it was upsetting enough to the hierarchy in Jerusalem, the leaders in Jerusalem to do something about it, what they would have condemned you of was blasphemy. And there was a very particular execution that would happen to you for blasphemy. And it comes out of the Hebrew scriptures. You would have been stoned to death. Jesus was not stoned to death. Jesus was hung on a cross. What we know about crucifixion at that time in the Roman Empire, in that particular part of the world, including in that particular part of the world, is that that form of agonizing death was reserved for people who revolted, for upstart slaves, for um, client peoples uh, in client states such as what Israel was under Rome, who uh, attempted to, you know, break break away from the oppose the Romans, break away from the Romans, and so it's really noteworthy that that's how Jesus was executed. It would seem that some people saw him as a threat, as threatening Rome, took him to the appropriate authorities, and he was put to death for that reason. That particular point, more than anything else that I have talked about in this class, I think would have to, have to be answered for if someone wants to make the argument that Jesus was simply a wisdom teacher or a theological figure or some kind of apolitical whatever, if you're, if you're gonna say that Jesus did not have some kind of politically threatening message, then you need to answer for why he was executed as a political criminal. And I don't think there is an explanation except that his teachings were rendered to be or received as so threatening to Rome that they put him to death for it. All right, so um, that covers uh, some bits about the about the prophetic challenge. There's a couple of other things I want to mention. And these have to do with not, this is not Horsley, uh, this is another scholar, Walter Wink, uh, talking about this. But there are other things about Jesus's teachings that I think are sometimes, and that, it, you know, this is backed up by Walter Wink, that are interpreted as being um, pacifying, I, I, sh I should say, or that are, you know, encouraging people to be utterly passive in the face of violence. So most famous one is turn the other, is turn the other cheek, right? And the idea is like, you know, if you're slapped, turn the other cheek so that it can be slapped too. So Walter Wink has this really interesting point on this, which is that in the Roman world, if a um, someone who was in power were to slap a, a subordinate, um, they would backhand them. Like that's how uh, the person would be would be hit, would be slapped. Well, and that was a sign of their, their social standing and superiority over that inferior. So the interesting thing though, is like when you kind of think about that, is if that person then turns the other cheek, it's not that they're a masochist, it's not that they're psyched to get hit again, um, or you know attempting to be utterly passive. Instead, they're giving a, a not so subtle um, message 
<laughs> to the person who is perpetuating this violence against them that you you want to hit me you want to hit me as as uh, an inferior now hit me as a peer like basically it's refusing the status of the subordinated person when you turn the other cheek some other stuff too jesus says if somebody takes your coat uh give 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 your shirt give the shirt off your back so why why would he say that well, there are specific rules in the Mosaic Covenant that say, you know, if you take someone's cloak, you have to give it back to them before sundown because that's that's all they have. And otherwise they will freeze, they'll go cold. Well, in the Rome, the Romans did not honor any of that. <laughs> and so Israel under Roman rule, uh very well, those many of those social expectations were disintegrating. And so say somebody comes and demands, you know, takes you to court and demands the coat off your back. Jesus is saying, give them your shirt too, basically meant that you would be standing there completely naked. And it was a way of, 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 of saying, look you have taken everything from me like look at what you have done like you who are bringing the shame on to me and i'm going to show everyone exactly what you have done and how wrong and aggressive it is it would be a lot like you know a multi-millionaire um foreclosing on like an orphanage and like forcing all of them out and then as a strategy <laughs> I'm making all of this up on the fly, by the way, as a strategy, <laughs> the person who runs the orphanage, you know, calls channel five or channel whatever and says, can you come down here with cameras? <laughs> that would be the same kind of deal there. Okay, last one that I'll mention. Jesus says, um, if somebody gives you their pack, um, you know, go, go an extra mile with them. Okay, so what we know is that there was a specific Roman regulation that you could force a civilian to carry your belongings for a mile before they went back. And you can imagine like how if you know you're a poor peasant person trying to scrape by, you know, you need to work as much as you possibly can, whether it's working your fields or if you're a day laborer getting hired for a day. So like to be suddenly imposed upon that you have to pick up a centurion's items and carry them for a mile and then walk a mile back like that's going to be hugely disruptive to you so then why does jesus say if somebody makes you walk a mile with their things go further go another mile well the idea there is that there was a regulation that you that a Roman soldier could not force you to go beyond a mile. And so if you were caught having somebody walk your things more than a mile, that centurion could actually get in trouble with their superior. And so this was again a way of sort of taking something that was dominating and exploitative to the people that it was happening to and turning it so that they then had the upper hand or they at least were you know inserting inserting some challenge into that relationship of domination so i think i'll leave it there uh that's that's a bit of jesus's prophetic <laughs> prophetic challenge and also some of the challenge that that is subtly or not so subtly embedded in Jesus's teachings. In the next class, I'm going to talk about community renewal, uh, which I think is really interesting. A big part of what Jesus was doing was not only you could think of the prophetic challenge as being sort of the outward focus towards the conspirators with Rome and towards Rome. And then 
the community renewal being more inward focused about what do we as communities who are dispossessed or excluded, how can we take care of each other and produce a community that's capable of resistance uh, in the context of everything that is all the complexity that that is going on. So that's what we're gonna we're gonna focus on next. Thank you so much for tuning in for this video, and I will see you in the next one.